Hyom says, since you're now independent and I've been doing it for a, a, a few months, how do you find being your own editor versus having oversight from editors in your previous publications? So I don't like editing other people's work. I never liked it. I never liked it when I was an editor. It was one of the things I wanted to get away from. I find it so fucking dull. I don't understand how people can do it. What I find hilarious is people who fucking invalidate, like they invalidate all of my entire work if it has typos and it's like I say this is how you can spot somebody who's either still in college or just isn't very intellectually developed uh they think when you make a spelling error they think it's because you can't spell and won't run a spell checker that's what they think what they don't realize is that yes I obviously can spell, but when you're typing and you, you're banging out something, a deadline super fast, sometimes typos are going to occur because I'm typing, you know what I mean? It's not, it's not like that. Then the other thing, of course, is very often the typos that get through, you will notice the typos that get through are typos where you miss out a letter but the word forms another word well a spell checker doesn't catch that so it's not that you don't even run a spell checker it's that you do run a spell checker but those words get through and then they go look it's so unprofessional it's so unprofessional you can show an article to like 10 people and the article can have typos in and 10 people won't pick up on them because our brains are trained to fucking just the, the, to auto correct in our brains and so ask yourself what type of cunt looks at an article can only see the typos and thinks the article is worthless as a result of there being typos I've seen people suggest on Reddit I should, you know, spend 50% of the money I make to have somebody basically check my articles for typos. Uh, no, I'm not going to do that. Nor do I think having typos invalidates my work when the New York Times, with a staff of like 400 people, has typos in it with award-winning editors. I'm not going to do that. So uh, but the bottom line is, uh, how do I find it? That's the only frustration, I think, in general. The people who criticize my work, I mean, it's hilarious. So uh, there's two criticisms of my work, and they're in polar, polar opposites with each other based on the type of work that I write. When I was doing The Evil Geniuses, people are going, oh, this is a bit dry. It's repertage. I don't want to add too much of a flourish to it. You have to be careful with that. I'm, I'm telling a story, but I can only retell the story factually as it's been told to me and as my research will verify. Then when I write something like the send off to CSGO I just put on my sub stack, people go, oh, it's just like he's ranting. It's it's really unprofessional. It's got like jokes in it. Which one is it? Do I have no voice or is my voice too loud? All oh, right, that's it. You're just a cunt. You're just a hater. I could I could write a fucking masterpiece. It would never be enough for you. So there is no there's no point in you know. It's like I say, you get to a point where the, you understand the feedback is worthless because it comes from the same names, the same people. It'll never be good enough for them. They're in every thread about every single thing you write, and they just hate readers. And it's fine. I got your click anyway, dickhead. So it gives a fuck. Le rent à la maison asks what story took the most amount of time to get right and why did you still get the tick rate wrong in cs2 uh, i did didn't i i did um get the tick rate wrong i suppose if we're being technical about it what story took the most amount of time i mean it depends because there are still stories i'm working on that i want to get right that i th i think i have all the pieces i'm just missing one piece and i'm always keeping my eyes open for that piece there's stuff i've been working on since 2013 2014 but you know i mean look it's going to be the same ba if you want a basic answer it's going to be the same every time it will be i by power because people don't people never remember the chronology on that story which was it was a fix oh no richard's lying here's some evidence it was a fix oh no the people who were saying it's a fix are lying here's some fine financial transactions from someone that acted as a broker yeah that guy's lying then you have like basically another four or five months of me being called a liar everyone in na hating me people doing all sorts of fucked up shit to me like trying to you know like just constant potential for cybercrime and all sorts of nonsense only for us to through working with csgo lounge conclusively find a paper trail along with 
evidence from a phone with corroborating text messages that prove beyond a shadow of a doubt bets were placed on the days that we saw the bets and the transfer of skins. So that took six months, like for one story that, you know, somebody like Jake Lucky had just tweet that out and do no background work, no forensic work, no investigative work. They would just tweet it out. This person has accused this team of fixing matches. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. That would be it. And people would say that was good now. But back when I was doing it, because you were accusing someone popular, you couldn't get away with it. And so I had to have everything. Everything. Funnily enough, when it comes to match fixing, you know, that does appear to be the standard by and large. So, so yeah, I'll say that. But there will be stories that come out that will conclusively be stories I've worked on for over 10 years. You know, if I assume and I get them over the line. Two Ton asks, in an alternate universe, you become the esports historian and Thorin becomes the investigative journalist. Do you think there are any events that will play out in the same fashion aside from not being able to visit Brazil? Uh, probably not. I think, like, for starters, if I was the esports historian, there would be, like, a massive blind spot for Quake. Certainly Overwatch, because I just would never have followed that for any i would never have dedicated my time to it i was looking at duncan's youtube channel the other day because i was pulling some videos to watch and uh he's got like 142 videos on overwatch alone like how can you be asked like i don't even know man so i mean he really took the esports historian thing seriously to a degree like i never would i would never have watched overwatch to chronicle that the only thing that's interesting and relevant about overwatch as it relates to esports is how the league will fail and what it will do to the perception of esports for the rest of time and i i think duncan has a when it comes to creating content i think he has a much more fastidious work rate than me i think he's very he does a video a day without fail i'm not that guy so yeah there'd be blind spots although source would be more well covered the history of source duncan wasn't there for that didn't want to cover that and he's gone back and done some stuff around source through research but as I ran the website that covered Source from start to finish, yeah, I, so, Source would be much more well covered because I can tell you a million and one stories and stories from someone who was there, you know, a genuine eyewitness account. In terms of him being an investigative journalist, I mean, it's kind of interesting. Uh, you know, I think, I think he definitely would have the chops for it, but I also think the most frustrating aspect of it for him would be just knowing stuff about people and knowing they get away with it. I don't know how long Duncan could sit on Pandora's box without wanting to fucking expose everybody. And it's it's hard, you know? Like, I know people have done some fucked up shit and I just got to swallow it because, like, there ain't enough evidence and you have to have evidence and it's maybe not your story to tell and they don't... and, the, and people don't want to tell it, you know? And this can be anything from, you know, like... People don't even like it when they get duped in a contract. People feel stupid, you know? Like, people don't want the world to know they signed something stupid. So, so even, like, silly little things like that, people can say to you, like, look, Richard, can you back channel and help me? But please don't write about this. And you go, all right, yeah, I don't want to make you look like a cunt. Th that would break Duncan's brain, I think. I, I think, like, I'm not saying he doesn't know as much as me, but I think, like, in terms of what's bad in the industry, but I think one thing Duncan always does is when he learns of something bad, he will dedicate his energies into manufacturing an outcome where it gets out and where he can talk about it. Whereas, you know, I'm more patient in the sense I'll sit on it for longer and hope another piece of evidence will fall in my lap or someone will trip up or something else will come out. And I play, like, you know, I'll play a long game with it. You know, I, I think me and Duncan, like, I wouldn't say we disagree on it, but it's like, yeah, I mean, it's two different philosophies. Like, if I never get that person, I, you know, they get away with it, right? But I'm bound by journalistic standards, you know, investigative journalistic standards. I have a high evidentiary standard. Duncan, you know, is the podcaster extraordinaire. And therefore, he, I, get, I guess he gets the color outside the lines a little bit more than me. So probably those would be the two fundamental differences, but uh, not much. We're both very similar in a lot of areas. 
uh, we're only really different in a few, a uh, couple, so... Come back here and make trouble again. Eh? And they tell them, what does it all mean?